Now we've come to our third lesson in the series of studies on the book of Job, one of the greatest books in the entire Bible. We have spoken about the date of this book, of its writing, of its authorship. We have told you what the great men of the earth have to say about this book. We have given you the statistics on the book. And we have spoken briefly about the great tribulation as pictured in this book, the pictures that it has of the sufferings of Jesus Christ, and its representation also of the suffering sinner in hell. We have mentioned also briefly the scientific data in the book, the philosophical data, the prophetic material, and the New Testament material that is peculiar to the New Testament only and yet found in type and foreshadowed many times in the book of Job. We are now ready to start our study of the book, uh, one chapter at a time, beginning with chapter 1, where the Holy Spirit takes us to the land of Uz and the land of Edom, south of the Dead Sea. And we read these words. There was a, la- a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that fears God and eschewed evil. Now this man is said to be perfect and upright, and yet we learn later from the study of the book that he was perfect and upright only in the sense of his outward deportment before man. God testifies to Job's goodness when he says to the devil in a face-to-face confrontation about Job, he says, Hast thou considered my servant Job, verse 8, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil? And yet with all this we learn from a later study of the book that Job throughout this is trusting his own righteousness. Therefore we learn a great truth about the term perfect in the word of God. The term perfect as it occurs is not a reference to sinlessness, but a term uh, that has to do with completion, a term that has to do with deportment and conduct. Whether the man was perfect and upright, we mean my outward stands as far as anybody could tell. And this is very apparent the further we get into the book, and especially when we get to Job chapter 31. But Job has a glaring fault which nobody sees but God. As a matter of fact, not even Job himself realized his fault until the Lord reveals it to him. And later in the book we'll find that Job's terrible fault was, although he was perfect and upright, he was trusting his perfection, and he was trusting his uprightness to be saved, and of course this will not do. And Job is brought to realize that no matter how good he is, and how perfect he is, and how upright he is, that he cannot save himself. Notice, please, in Job chapter 9, verse 20, these words that are wrested from Job's lips by sorrow, suffering, and torture. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. That was said by the perfect and upright man. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse, and though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul, I would despise my life. Job has learned a great truth by the time we get to these chapters, but this is much later. Job has learned the great truth that uh, if he was perfect, it wouldn't do him any good in God's sight, and if he was perfect, he wouldn't know it. And if he were to say he was perfect, his mouth would make a liar out of him, because a man who was perfect wouldn't say it. But Job has all these bitter lessons to learn about self-righteousness only after the Lord has dealt with him, and only after he's been delivered, at least for a while, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And we read about his wealth in verse 3 and 4 and 5. Then we read the first indication of Job's spirituality in verse 5 when we read, But Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, this is an amazing statement about this Old Testament saint. This man has a discernment and an understanding of spirit matters that you'll not find in the heart life of any major psychiatrist, educator, or psychologist in America or Europe. He recognized the fact that although a man may conduct himself outwardly in a proper manner, there is a chance that in the heart there can be bitterness and resentment against God. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Somebody said people wouldn't do that. There is an atheist on earth who hasn't done that. These people go around and say God is dead and there isn't any God and all this and that business. You know what they're doing? They're cursing God in their hearts. They're condemning him. Some of them so far as to say that he's died. 
and I suppose you're going to write an epitaph for him before long. Job recognized that every man is a potential atheist. And a man is a believer as long as things go well with him, but when things go tough with him, he is always in danger of turning against God. You read about this in the New Testament, where the Bible says, Beware, let any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and many be defiled thereby. And the context of that passage is talking about a man who's hardening his heart against God and is being resentful and bitter about something that God has done to him. In Hebrews chapter 12, in the New Testament context, we read in the passage where it says, Looking diligent, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It has to do with a man resenting God's dealing with him. Job recognized this in his songs. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The sons of God in the Old Testament are always spoken of in an angelic sense. For example, these sons of God mentioned here in Job chapter 1 verse 6 are found again in Job chapter 38 verse 2 to 8. You'll notice in Job 38, long before the time of Moses, that the sons of God are always spoken of as angels who appear before the throne. They are never referred to as anybody's godly line. We have some scholars who refer to the sons of Seth as the godly line of Seth. But this is an ancient Hebrew superstition that has nothing to do with the word of God. For if you will study your Bible carefully, you will find there is nothing godly about Christ's line. Now there is such a thing as a messianic line, but no such thing as a godly line. Simply because Noah and Shem were found the same line, gives nobody the alibi to call that a godly line. Why listen? In the messianic line is an adulterer, David, a fornicator, Judah, a harlot, Rahab, and three women who are not Jews, but outside the land, outlandish women. An adulteress, Bathsheba. Uh, the Christian should be careful to discern between tradition and what the Word of God says. There is no such thing in the Bible as a godly line. There is such a thing in the Bible as a messianic line. But the sons of God in Job chapter 1 verse 6 are plainly present with Satan, and they are certainly not the sons of Seth. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Showing the devil is able to go pass through solid objects, he's a spirit being. God is a spirit, Satan is a spirit. Now here we have the veil of heaven rent aside for a while, and we get a glimpse of the third heaven and the activities that take place in a situation you'd know nothing about apart from the supernatural revelation of God. There is nothing in nature. There is nothing in the religions of Hinduism, Brahmism, Taoism, Buddhism, or Mohammedanism, that would reveal to you the operations that go on in the spirit world between God and Satan. They are found only in the Holy Bible. And here Satan is presented as the great prosecuting attorney, the great solicitor, the great district attorney, the great accuser of the brethren who accuse them day and night before God, who deceives the whole world. He has come to get permission to attack Job. Job is one that fears God and escheweth evil. The word escheweth means to turn from, to turn away from. Or as a country preacher said, some things are much better eschewed than chewed, and tobacco is one of them. And so the devil comes before the Lord and asks for permission. You will notice the violence of action once the permission is obtained. And people who are not dualistic, People who are not dualistic, that is, people who don't recognize good and evil, heaven and hell, hot and cold, up and down. People who call evil good and good evil, see Isaiah chapter 5, can never understand what's going on in the universe because the universe is plainly dualistic. The Bible plainly reveals the God of heaven, the Lord, and the God of this world, Satan. The Lord is Christ, Jesus Christ, and the devil is Christ, the Antichrist. This, of course, puts Buddhism, Hinduism, Brahmism on a terrible footing. For in all these systems, one is trying to pretend the dualities do not exist. And 
and this is unreality, they do exist. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? And the Lord said to Satan, verse 8, Hast thou considered my servant Job? You bet your life he'd considered him. When a man like Paul shows up, the devil knows him. He said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? When a man like Simon Peter shows up, the devil knows him. Christ says to Peter, Satan not desired to sift you like wheat. When a man like David shows up, the devil knows he's around. When a man like Abraham shows up, the devil considers him. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? He's questioning Job's motive for being pious. Job is devout and he's pious in serving the Lord, but the problem comes up, motive. I mean, many people do good works because they're afraid to do bad works. The motive isn't proper. Many people do good works because they found that it pays financially. The motive isn't right. Have you ever sat down and taken a sheet of paper and written on that sheet of paper the things you've done for God just because you love God and wanted to please Him? I think it would be an amazing thing for every Christian to go home and take out a piece of paper and write down that sheet of paper what he'd done for the Lord that he did just for the Lord with a pure motive to obtain nothing from it but God's approval. I wonder how many items you could uh, conjure up in a period of, say, ten years. Doth Job fear God for naught? Satan's attack and proposition is very plain. He's saying the reason why Job fears you, verse 10, is because you blessed him materially. And if you take away his material blessings, he won't fear you and he'll sin against you. Verse 11, he will curse thee to thy face. Some piety is only pocketbook deep. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Now Christ said about this being, he said, You're of your father the devil, and lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is lying about Job. Because to tell the truth, when the Lord allows the devil to take what he has, Job does not curse God to his face. Notice his response, verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. O oh, remarkable man. You realize what happened when the devil finally got permission? Look at the quick decision. The Lord said to Satan, verse 12, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord, and as soon as he does, the action starts. Now this is a glimpse into the realm of the supernatural that is completely obscure and hidden from the eyes of every unregenerate scientist, artist, educator, poet, physicist, musician, and psychiatrist that ever lived. And Charlie Darwin and Sigmund Freud and Huxley and Lyle knew no more about these matters than a three-year-old Eskimo who knows about Egyptian hieroglyphics or Babylonian cuneiform. These glimpses into the spirit world are found in the last chapter in 1 Kings and Ezekiel 14 and 2 Thessalonians 2. And what it amounts to is that God, the sovereign king of the universe, can get, grant permission to the devil to do certain things, but the devil can go no further than God allows. For example, notice in the first permission, it is take what he has, only don't touch him. In the second encounter, the Lord tells Satan in chapter 2, verse 6, Go on, touch him, but don't take his life. And if there had been a third encounter, which thank God there wasn't, the Lord would have told Satan, okay, take his life. 
Hebrews chapter 2, the devil has the power of death. But don't touch his soul. Now this should be a great comfort to the born again child of God when he realizes that although the devil is God's rod, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You say, well, how can the devil be a comfort to a child of God? Well, when the Lord starts beating you, you get back close to him, don't you? And that's when you get your comfort. There's many an old-time child with an old-time parent that found out years ago when mom and daddy began to switch with the peach tree switch, the safest place was to run in and grab mom and daddy by the legs. He destroyed the leverage of the arm, don't you see? I think it holds you out to arm's length. They could make you dance the fan man to go man with that thing, but if you got in close, they had to come down over your back and it broke some of the power. By Rob and I staff, they comfort me. Now this glimpse into the unknown world of the supernatural is revealed only in the word of God, and if you find anything like it in the Koran, it will be copied from the Old Testament. This is the revelation of God. You reject it at your own peril. And having rejected it, which some of you have, you are wide open, fair game, in the season, for the greatest most brilliant, powerful, intelligent, prosecuting attorney that ever lived. His Majesty, the Devil. And he's not the devil of Goethe's Faust, who gets one man's soul on a swap. And he's not the old split foot of the frontier days. And he's not the man in the red pajamas with the horn and the three foot. Uh, prong pitchfork of the cartoon papers. You are dealing with an adversary so powerful that before the incarnation, one member of the Trinity said, the Lord rebuked the old Satan, and one member of the Trinity had to refer him to the other member of the Trinity to get him rebuked. Did you ever read that one? That's found over in the book of uh, in Zechariah. And the book of Zechariah, where the Lord is rebuking Satan in Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 4, one member of the Trinity had to refer him to the other member of the Trinity for rebuke. That's the one who set his heart on Job. And that's the one who is determined to get Job to curse God to prove his point. He's called the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, and you fool around with him at your peril. Fools make a mock at sin. Not even Michael dared bring against him a railing accusation, but said that the Lord rebuked the old Satan. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord, verse 12, and then all hell broke loose. In 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, Job lost all his children, all his cattle, all his servants, his house smashed to the ground, and when this thing takes place, Job has to have ten funerals at one time. Is there anybody who could throw a stone at Job for his later feelings and expositions? Is anybody who could really throw a, a rock at Job a little bit later in the book of Job where he begins to complain and holler? Well, the Lord could, I guess, but I guess the Lord would be the only one. A woman lost five children in the Johnstown flood. She placed each of her babies on a little old piece of board or plank or something as it floated by to try to save the child, and she never saw any one of them again. And half the club is over and she survived. She said, I'm going back to my home in Virginia. I've got to think for a while. Lost five children. I know a family in Canton, Ohio, an unsaved man, a woman that went to the theater one night. When they came home, they found the house burned to the ground and four children burned to death. Can anybody speak up for these kind of people? Job had ten caskets to bury in one day. And after all, in need with a man like that, who do Alexander the Great and Napoleon and Charlemagne and Genghis Khan and Jack Kennedy and Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, what do they really amount to? I mean, when laid in the balances and weighed out even. Verse 20, then Job arose and went his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground 
and worshipped and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to her. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We all come in the same way we go out. We all check out the same way. Even when we start, even when we finish. You people I'm talking to right now, someday, somebody else will undress you and put your clothes back on you. You say, well, look, when I'm 50 years old or 60 years old, I've been dressing myself for 30, 40 years, you know, that kind of business. You won't always. Someday they'll take your dead carcass and take it down there and put it up against the wall and hose it down and push the tubes in under your arms and drain your legs and get the blood out of you and wash your dead body and dress you back up again. And you came in naked, you go out naked, friend. The Lord gave, the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, remarkable man. Where do you find Job and God are smitten in? Is he down the pub or the pool hall? No. Is he down at the bullseye store getting drunk? No. Is he out with Bishop uh, uh, Blake trying to contact the spirit of his dead children with the Ouija board and calling on the spirits to rap on wood? No. He's at a prayer meeting. He's at a prayer meeting. Blessed be the name of the Lord in all this. Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I tremble when I read the words. Do you mean to tell me if he charged God with anything, it wouldn't have been, it would have been foolishly? After taking everything he had? And yet the divine text intimates that if Job had found one fault with God taking his property and his family and his money, he'd have been a fool. I wonder how that applies to some of us. You see, there's more in the book of Job than meets the eye. If you're looking for New Testament practice and practical Christianity, you'll find a sight more in the book of Job than you will in the book of Matthew. Job 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord says to Satan, rubbing it in, Hast thou considered my servant Job, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Job's not going to drop prayer meeting. He's not going to quit coming to church. He's going to quit reading his Bible. He's going to quit tithing just because he got sacked. He still holds fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to, to destroy him. First type of Christ without cause. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, they hated him without a cause. Here the Lord makes a strange admission. Here the Lord of glory and the Father of Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, in whose hand the constellation are handled like a sack full of marbles, says, you are moving me against that guy to destroy him and no cause for doing it. The Lord says that. He's like, this can't understand why. Yeah, but that's the thing, you see. That's where, that's where it gets thick. And without the book of Job and the special revelation of God, you, you never could possibly understand it. Now, for one thing, you say, why did God let him do that if there wasn't any reason for it? Well, the Lord had higher reasons. When the Lord said without a cause, the Lord was saying to Satan, look at here. I'm giving you permission to do to that guy what I normally wouldn't give you permission to do unless that guy was an out-and-out, low-down, dirty, rotten, thieving, conniving, lying, murderous, adulterous sneak. That would have been a cause. But for what he's done, the Lord says, he doesn't deserve what he's getting without a cause. You say, well, then why did God do it? Well, number one, Job needed a lesson in self-righteousness. Don't some of us? Number two, Job needed a lesson so he wouldn't forget that God was in control, not him. Boy, do our congressmen ever need that, man. And number three, the Lord intended to bless him in the end with twice as much as he had to start with. Now, what were you saying? 
4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. It's a proverb. It isn't true, but it's so generally true, you can say it. A stitch in time saves nine. Well, not always. A stitch in time might only save three. Or a stitch in time might save twenty. Or a stitch in time might not do any good if the garment burn up. You understand some of us have been exposed to higher learning. I mean, I've gotten over it, but I've been exposed. I understand these relativists are always trying to figure out the exception to overthrow the rule. We know that the exception proves the rule. Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath to give for his life, generally speaking, yes. Always? Never. Do you think Paul was more worried about his life than preaching? Why, he said, I'm, I'll glad to lay down my life for the Lord Jesus Christ, and did. He didn't bother him to put his head in the chopping block. While there have been martyrs who thought so little of their life, they'd burn at the stake before they'd compromise. Do you think it was true of Jesus Christ that all he had he'd give for his life? Why, he came to lay down his life for many, and lay down his life for the sheep. But, you've got to admit, it's a pretty solid rule. You see him in the hospital, having shin the oxygen tent, grasping for one more breath of air. Have you seen him drowning, trying to get one more breath of air? Skin for skin, all that a man has to give for his life. Haven't you heard the gangsters and the gangsters moving, begging not to be shot? It's a real-life picture, that much of it. Haven't you seen the people in the Titanic offering a million dollars to get a seat in a lifeboat when they couldn't get it? It happens all the time. Skin for skin, all that a man has to give for his life. Didn't you read about the people up there that crashed up there in the rugged northern hills and they got down to cannibalism where they're eating each other in order to stay alive? Skin for skin, all that a man has to give for his life. Why, there are cases in the Bible and Lamentations and Second Kings where women got so hungry they ate their own children. You say, I don't believe that. Well, you're not very realistic, are you? It's gone on more than once. Skin for skin, all that a man has to give for his life, that's the general truth. But, put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, that's where it hurts. Like a doctor said to me one time, generally speaking, people can stand anything more than they can stand pain. I mean, if they've lived with something that just aches and hurts day and night and night and day, it's tough. The doctor said, well, you just have to learn how to live with it. Well, people do, but no man's happy on the rack. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. My, what a fearful permission. What do you suppose would happen to some of us right now if the devil could get permission from God to do to us what he wants to do to us? I count myself a happy man. I'm 56 years old this year. I lived 27 years an unsaved man. I lived 28 years now as a saved man. I count myself most blessed to have lived as long as I lived. I've been living on barred time since I was 40 years old. I read these verses and I say to myself, I wonder what the devil would like to do to me if he could get permission. And listen, I thank God every day of my life, and I'll give you good advice whether you take it or not, but you better thank God every day of your life for the times that the Lord God Almighty has overruled the devil on your behalf. And you won't know how many times you get home to glory and face both of them, how many times God saved your neck, or your family, or your church, or your home, or your health. You'll never know. You'll never know. The devil's a false accuser. He'll make you think that God has really given you a raw deal. Don't you believe it? The Lord has been mighty merciful to most of us. Mighty long-suffering. Mighty good. Mighty kind. And when it gets tough, we'll have to remember our present light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh a far more exceeding weight of glory, while we look at those things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
Job's in the furnace. He's going to the finer refiner's fire. He's on the rack. The devil's got him. He's turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved, and he's in the grinders, and they're going to grind the powder. We'll see more in our next lesson how these things worked out when we study Job's second response to his second trial, where the devil hit him and gave him an incurable disease and turned his own wife against him. More about this on our fourth lesson on the book of books, the book of Job.